Well, all right, good evening, everybody. It is so good to be here tonight, so good to see you. If you're out in the foyer, I'm going to ask that you come in tonight. We're going to start our service for you who are streaming live on Facebook tonight. We want to invite you to join in with us and thank you for uh, tuning in. I'm excited to be here tonight. I'm back from two days at our state conference for the Assemblies of God. I will tell you, it was so good to connect in during those two days and to understand the rich heritage that we have as an organization, the Assemblies of God. We talked about what happened in the early 1900s as the Assemblies of God were formed and the fire fell and the Holy Ghost moved. And then in both of those services, as we held services Monday night and Tuesday night, the altars were packed. God was moving in an incredible way. The fire literally fell. It was just an awesome time in his presence. And we're trusting that that fire is going out of that place and coming back to the local churches with the pastors who were there because all over the state, pastors came for this conference. We had an ordination service and there were probably a dozen people who were ordained on Tuesday night. So it was just such a special time. I'll be bringing you guys some of that on Sunday just to encourage you. But for now, why don't you stand with me and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's invite him into this place tonight. We simply get into his presence and ask him to do whatever it is that he wants to do tonight and just make room for him. So Father, we come into your presence tonight, Lord just asking for your anointing to be upon this service, Lord, and in this place. Father, I'm asking that you would help us to set aside everything, Lord, that would distract us from you tonight. Lord, every hindrance, Lord, we stand against that in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I simply proclaim freedom in this place to come into your presence, to see you, to worship you tonight. Lord, we desire, Lord, your spirit to fall in this place. Lord, I'm saying have your way in us and through us. Lord, do whatever it is that you want to do in this service. Lord, we're here just to worship you, just to adore you tonight, Lord, just to see you tonight. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship him tonight.
we thank you that we can look to you when we don't know where to look. God, I thank you that you are our rock, our refuge. God, I thank you that you are the shield, God, who protects us. God, I thank you that no matter what we go through or what we see, you are always worthy and you are always on your throne. And for that, we sing hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you that you reign. Thank you that you reign. Thank you that you are king. And God, we worship you. And we just prepare our hearts to receive the word that you have for us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you greet somebody just before you sit down? Kids, you can go, yes. All right, Pastor Vic's got to find his Bible. <laughs> How are you all tonight? So it's good to see all of you tonight. I hope you guys are having a great week. We're coming off of a couple days that have just been really incredible uh, at the state meeting. Uh, words cannot describe those two services that happened Monday night and Tuesday night. And uh, we headed back today. I'm going to be posting uh, some links out to our Facebook for uh, at least one of those services. Uh, and hopefully you'll be able to pick that up and, uh, and to uh, really look at that service and to hear the message that was there because it was a powerful, powerful message. Uh, in that service they did, 
a presentation called Worship Throughout the Decades, and it was really great. You know, it took, it took our worship as Assembly of God and Pentecostals all the way from the beginning of the 1900s all the way through, and it was really, really strong. We just had a great time, and the message that uh, was preached by uh, Denny Duran uh, at, the, uh, at the Monday night meeting was just really fantastic. All right, so turn with me to uh, Revelation chapter 6. We're going to start in Revelation chapter 6. You know, last week we looked at the signs at the end times that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 24. And we took a lot of time to go through those signs that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24 and to talk about how those are not only happening right before our eyes, but they're happening with increased frequency and exponentially those signs are just unfolding right before us. And we said the alarming thing today isn't that those signs are happening because we see them all around us. The alarming thing today is seeing how quickly they are happening and how there is a convergence on just not one or two of the things that Jesus said would be happening, but it is as if all of them are happening right now, right before our eyes in a condensed format, like the Spirit has just literally reached into time and ratcheted up the prophetic time clock. That's what it feels like to me, that we are just speeding on to, uh, to this climax of, of what is going to happen and what is going to unfold. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see these things, know that it is near at the doors. And so he says, when you begin to see these things happening, when they begin to unfold at the pace that we see them unfold, understand that it is literally at the door. It is literally right there, and it is coming to fruition. And he says, assuredly, I tell you that this generation, which generation? The generation that is seeing these signs will not pass away until all these things take place. That's why I'm excited to be alive in this time, because we get to see everything that God is doing in these last days. We get to see and participate in the outpouring of his spirit and trust me, he will be pouring out his spirit in increasing measures in these times that we're living in because this world needs an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. God is not done in this world with Pentecost. He is not done with his spirit being poured out in this day that we're living in. We need it now more than ever. And I believe that we're going to see signs and wonders and we're going to see a move of God in this time, in this generation, in this time that you and I are living in because the harvest is plentiful and the enemy's time is short. And the Bible tells us in Isaiah 59, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God will raise up a standard against him, and that is exactly what is happening in these days, and it's exciting because you and I get to be part of that tonight. You and I get to be part of that every single day as we walk with him, and so I look at every day now, and I'm saying, Lord, what is the opportunity that you're giving me every single day to walk in the power and the anointing of your Holy Spirit? You know, we... At, at this seminar that we went to at this uh, it's the conference meeting, the annual conference meeting, we were talking about the fact that the assemblies as an organization, that we, that we must connect in with the younger generation, right? We must be careful that, that these values that we have, this is a generational thing. You guys understand, this is a generational thing, and, and our children and their children are going to be standing on our shoulders if Jesus tarries long enough, and they're going to continue on the work that God has begun, right? And so it's our prayer that they experience the Spirit, that they experience what we have experienced, and it becomes real to them. And the number one barrier, the number one reason why the church is losing its effectiveness today the number one reason why that generation is failing to come in is authenticity. 
authenticity. They are not seeing in the churches what the churches are professing that they believe. And to them, what they want is nothing more than, nothing less than the real thing. They want to come in and they want to experience those things that we say that we believe, those things that we read in Scripture. And they are this generation that is saying, I, I don't want to just hear about what happened in the past. I just don't want to hear about the great stories about how God moved at some point, at some time in history, but I want to see God move here and now. And trust me, that generation is all in in a big way when they begin to see the authenticity. And so it is up to you and I, it is up to us to walk in that authenticity. And so what does that mean in these last days? I wasn't even planning on going here tonight, but what does that mean in these last days? To me, it simply means this, that the power and the anointing of God's spirit in my life is real. That it's real and it's active. That, that there is a demonstration in my life that I'm not just talking about it, but something is there to demonstrate that that power is real. And that's the Holy Spirit working in me and working through me. It is the same with you. When the Spirit is working through us and God is demonstrating his power in our lives, people are going to be attracted to that. They're going to see it and they're going to understand that it is bringing life in a world that is pushing death. Spiritual death, right? In a world that is taking from us all of the life that we have, trying to take the world's life away from it, they see that life and they see that authenticity. And so that's why, that's why I love what God is doing in this generation. And so you ask yourself the question, how do I respond in this day? Who's going to even be able to survive in these days? What can I do or what should I do in these days as we, as we read the events of Matthew 24, as we get further into Revelation and we understand what's about to unfold? What is my role as a Christian? What does God want me to do? How does he want to use me? You see, that's the question, right? It's not a question of how do I hang on. It's a question of, God, how are you going to use me in this time? What are you going to do in me and through me in this time? Because if God is through with me, or if I'm not usable to God, what am I doing here? That's the question. And the very fact that you are here tonight, the very fact that you are in love with him, the very fact that you desire for him to do something in your life, in you and through you, tells me that God is not done with you tonight. He's not done with me tonight. He's got something for us we just have to figure it out and walk it out and trust him, right? And I, I, I promise you we overcomplicate this way too much. I promise you that if we would just stand back and say, Lord, you do what you want to do and just get out of the way and let him do what he wants to do, that we would see exploits happen for the kingdom of God. We just overcomplicate it so much. What is God looking for in this time? What should our response be? Here am I, Lord, send me. That's it. That's what Isaiah said. The Lord said, who will go for us? Who will we send? And Isaiah raised his hand and he said, here I am, Lord, send me. But understand, Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips and I come from an unclean people and God cleansed him on the spot. And so our, our response is in this time, we should look to him, we should surrender to him, and we should let him do what he wants to do and trust him for incredible things. Trust him at his word. In Joel chapter 2, Joel, Joel is a scripture that Peter quoted in the book of Acts when he said, in the last days, God is going to pour his spirit out on all flesh. And your sons and daughters will prophesy and your young men will dream, will uh, have visions. Your young men will dream dreams. Your old men will have visions. And he talks about that and he says, this is the time that I'm talking about. This time, Pentecost, the outpouring of the Spirit, we're living in those days and you and I are living in those days. In that same chapter, this is how this chapter starts. The Lord is saying this, blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. It is at hand. Yeah. That is talking about the days that you and I are living in. So what is our place in this time? We should be blowing the trumpet. 
We should be sounding the alarm. We should be telling everybody the time to get right with the Lord, the time to get serious with the Lord, the time to look to him isn't tomorrow. It isn't three weeks from now. It is today because there's a sense of urgency about what God wants to do and what is about to happen. And so you and I should be the ones in this time who are not hiding away, but we're standing on the wall and we've got the lantern and the light and we're saying, hey, you got to figure this out right now because disaster is about to happen. God is about to come. He is about to do something. Judgment is on the way. Sound the alarm. Blow the trumpet. That's what we should be doing. And then in verse 12, he goes on and he says, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he's gracious He's merciful, he's slow to anger, of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him. What motivates us to do what we do in these times? We're sounding the alarm, we're blowing the trumpet, we are calling men and women and children everybody to repentance, to getting to the point where they surrender to God, where they get serious with him, where they get their lives right with the Lord and experience God's mercy. That's why God has put you and I in this place, in this time. He's put us there to be salt and light. He's put us there to say to a generation, by the way, that is struggling and is lost and and doesn't know where to turn, that we have the answer. That the answer is true and his name is Jesus and he is there and he is ready to forgive you of your sins. He is ready to cleanse you. His mercy is real today and God is calling you not because he wants to judge you but because he wants you to repent and he wants you to get right with him and that's possible in these times. And so when I look at the times that we're living in, I'm excited about these times that we're living in. It's not gloom and doom for me as I see these things unfolding. There is a sense of urgency in me saying, we are getting so close to the time when Jesus is coming back, and that motivates me more than anything to get serious in myself about the time frame and the urgency in my heart. And I have to tell you that it's, it, it should be that way every single day where it's getting more urgent in our heart, where where we say we understand what's going on and God has called us to be that mouthpiece for him. Jesus said this, he said, unless the days would be cut short, all flesh would perish, but he who perseveres to the end will be saved. And I want to encourage you, come what may, no matter what we see as as this thing begins and continues to unfold and things may get a little crazy or a little uncomfortable, just persevere. Just persevere. How do you persevere? You press in with him and you trust him, right? Because he's not going to leave you by yourself. He will walk through it with you. Amen? Somebody better say amen in this place tonight. Don't let me up here preach all by myself. Help me out tonight. The seals then, as we look at the book of Revelation and we get into chapter 6, There is a direct correlation between what Jesus says in Matthew 24 and what actually happens in the book of Revelation. In other words, when Jesus tells the Jewish people of his time what is going to happen as we get closer and further along and we get into these end times and into the tribulation, he says there are certain things that are going to happen leading in. And what we see in Revelation is seals that are being broken that line up exactly with what Jesus says is going to happen. Now, Jesus was very clear, and he said this. He said, they are going to be like birth pangs. Many of you have had children. Many of you have had multiple children, and you understand what birth pangs are. They start out kind of mild. They start out okay, but they begin then to increase in frequency And they get closer and closer together and in intensity, right? That's exactly what's going to happen. It's going to start out slow. It's going to ramp up. It's going to gear up. And then we're going to go full steam into the book of Revelation. And so I believe that these these signs that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, he's actually talking about the days leading into the opening of the seals. But then when the seals are open, it really starts to happen in a very big way. 
right? And so the very evidence that we see today on these things happening as we looked at it last week tells me that prophecy is true, tells me that the Bible is true because it is unfolding with unbelievable accuracy right in front of our eyes. And so in Revelation chapter 6, we'll start in verse 1. This is John. He said now, and he's up in heaven at this point. Remember in chapter 5, I believe it is, John hears a voice and the voice says, come up here. And so John's perspective changes. He's no longer on the island of Patmos seeing the vision and hearing what God is saying, but God has now literally taken him in the spirit from the island of Patmos and brought him into heavenly places where he's actually an eyewitness of things unfolding, right? It's a picture, I believe, of the rapture of the church, right? I believe that there's going to be a time it's evidenced by that and many other scriptures where God is simply going to say to his church, come up here. It's time. He's going to say to Jesus, go get your bride and bring her back. And hopefully I'm going to be right up at the top saying, Lord, take me first, right? <laughs> hopefully I'm going to hear that and anticipate that because that's what we're longing for, right? And so if you read chapter 5, you're going to see this vision that he has of heaven and he sees all the splendor. And leading into this, there's a question in chapter 5 because he sees the seal, he sees the scroll that needs to have the seals open, and there's nobody in heaven who's found worthy enough to open the seals until the Lamb, Jesus Christ, steps up and says, I can do that, I'll do that, right? And it's a beautiful picture of what is happening in heaven right before these seals are open, that Jesus, who has taken his rightful place, as King of kings and Lord of lords, the only one who rightfully is able to open the seals begins to open the seals. And he says, Now I saw when the Lamb, Jesus, opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying in a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said this. He said, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. I am on the wrong page. Go back. Matthew 24, 4, Jesus said, watch out that no one deceives you because many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. This scripture of the rider on the white horse is actually a picture of the Antichrist being revealed at the beginning of the tribulation. You see, if you go further into Revelation in chapter 19, you're going to find another rider on a white horse. It's Jesus Christ. And he's clearly the conquering hero that is coming back with the armies of heaven. He is the one who is faithful and true, the true rider on the white horse. But this rider on the white horse at the beginning of the tribulation is the Antichrist being revealed. In this instance, it's a human who is energized by Satan and he is beginning a world conquest. This is what we're seeing. He has... Behold, a white horse, he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. This is exactly what the Antichrist is going to do. What we believe is going to happen is that the church is going to be raptured. When the church is raptured, can you imagine the chaos that is going to happen when literally millions of Christians disappear? You can imagine what happens when all of a sudden people wake up one day or, or turn around one day in the middle of the day and all of a sudden people who have been around them working with them just disappear, yeah. right? When a Christian pilot of an airplane all of a sudden disappears, right? Think about the chaos that is going to ensue and in that moment the Antichrist is going to begin to come on the scene and he is going to begin to take control in the midst of the chaos. Part of the reason why we believe that the first three and a half years are going to be a time of relative world peace, and I say relative world peace from the Antichrist standpoint, is because uh, we understand that it's mid, mid time into the tribulation at the three and a half year mark that he actually goes into the temple and declares himself to be God. It is at that point in Revelation that you see then that he begins to attack the Christians and pour out his wrath on the Christians at that point. But for the first three and a half years, 
He's coming in as the man who has the answer to all the world's problems. It's one of the reasons why here he's shown as carrying a bow, but notice what he doesn't have. He doesn't have any arrows. So he's coming in with some kind of authority, but he's not coming in as a warrior in the first three and a half years. He's not coming in to conquer from a military standpoint. He is, he is coming in and it's going to be a bloodless conquest that he launches. It may suggest that he's going to somehow overpower the minds and the will of men and women without physical destruction. And you ask, how is that done? It's done by something that we see very clearly in front of us, especially in these times, especially in the last few years, through deceit, through lying, misleading people, deceiving people, and overcoming them with that kind of rhetoric, overcoming them with that kind of language. And look, we see it all around us, don't we? You know, people not understanding what the truth is, and you have so many voices out there who convincingly tell you that this is the truth, even though you don't know that it's the truth. And people in this time, when this begins to happen, they're simply going to be looking for answers. And this person is going to come on the scene, literally empowered by Satan, and is going to seemingly have the answers. And so what is it that the Bible says in the New Testament that literally deceiving spirits are going to go out into the world in the end times? Deceiving spirits. And if it were possible, the Bible says, they do such a good job at their deception that even the elect would be deceived if it were possible. Okay? So what does that tell me? In the days and the hours leading into the revealing of the Antichrist, the point of the rapture of the church we have to be careful that we don't fall into that deception, right? We have to be careful that we are, are lining ourselves up with the word of God, that we are vetting out everything that we hear, everything that we believe. Don't you believe it because you hear it on the news? That's the last thing that you want to believe these days, right? Our news, especially in America, is not reporting much correctly. I'm tied into a lot of sites all around the world it may surprise you to understand that just in the last seven days, there have probably been 120 rockets fired at Israel. You don't hear that in the news in the United States. I doubt you have heard that at all in your news feeds, but it's happening throughout the world. They are selectively filtering out pertinent information that you and I should know, and the narrative is being controlled. And there are people who are getting up even today with conviction speaking lies and deception, and people are just following that blindly. And so why would we think that it would be a stretch in the midst of chaos, in the midst of confusion, that somebody would stand up with the answer and that people would be willing to follow? And so that's really what it's going to be like. It's really noteworthy here that in Matthew 24, the first words that Jesus spoke in Matthew 24 to his disciples is, watch out that nobody deceives you. And he says that throughout Matthew chapter 24. He says, be on your guard because deception is coming. Make sure that you are lining up with the word of God. I have to make sure that I'm lining up with the word of God because this world will tell me today that things that I know are displeasing to God, things that I know to be sinful, things that I know that, that God doesn't endorse or God doesn't stamp his stamp of approval on, this world will tell me it's okay. This world will tell me today to live my life any way that I want to live it, and God is going to be okay with it. It's a lie out of the pit of hell. And what it will do is it will take me further away from him instead of bringing me closer to him. And so you better be sure that you're locking into the word of God and that everything that you hear, that you are running past the filter of what you know to be in God's word. Revelation chapter 6, verse 4, the second seal was opened. He said, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature, remember there's four living creatures around the throne, say, come and see. Another horse, fiery and red, went out and was, it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. Now, this rider is easy to recognize because war begins to break out. Even though the Antichrist is coming on the scene and he's going to have the answers and he's going to try to consolidate all of that in his power base and he's going to try to 
to control the people, there is going to be unrest and there's going to be worldwide conflict that is happening. Now, the interesting thing about this conquest here, about this, about this war or, or this rider, is that the word here for slay is actually the word slaughter. It is, it is tied to not military action, but civil unrest. That in the context is what this is talking about when you get into the original language. This is not war like you would consider a nation going against a nation. What is happening with the rider of this horse is that peace is taken from the world and civil uprisings are beginning to happen and people are beginning to fight with one another and slaughter one another literally within the cities. Literally all over the world there will be lawlessness and civil unrest that is really not connected to traditional war that we think. This shouldn't surprise us at all either because we've seen this over the last two years all over the United States. When Jesus said, and lawlessness will abound, we're living that out right now in our time. Lawlessness is abounding. People are doing what they seem to think is right in their own eyes, and literally we see our cities burning in various parts of the country all over the world. If you saw the news feeds all over the world, that civil unrest is happening. It's going to amp up exponentially during the tribulation. And as things begin to get worse, people are actually going to go to the point where they're going to be killing one another. It's not just going to be rioting and looting and all of that kind of thing. It's destroying property. It's going to get to the point where peace itself is going to be removed. It's going to be taken. That's what the rider of this horse is going to do. And so we've had examples of that all over. There's also another possibility, although I think the first thing that I said is actually what's going to happen. It could also be alluding to the war in Ezekiel 38 and 39. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, we know the Bible talks about uh, two wars that are going to happen coming into the tribulation. I believe one of them is going to happen before the tribulation, and one is going to happen, uh, in my mind, right around the time that the church is raptured or shortly thereafter at the beginning of the tribulation. One is the Psalm 83 war. If you look in Psalm 83, you're going to see that the players in the Psalm 83 war are the nations that surround Israel, the border nations around Israel. And this is going to be a war for the territory that God originally gave Israel. In that war, God is miraculously going to give Israel the ability to win that conflict, and Israel is going to regain much of the promised land that God originally gave to Israel that's been taken away. There's going to be a reclaiming of that blessing, a reclaiming of what God said, I'm giving you to Abraham everywhere your foot steps. That's the Psalm 83 war. The Ezekiel 38 and 39 war appears to be Russia, Iran, uh, likely Turkey, maybe Ethiopia, if you look at the players who are there. And they are going to look at Israel and they're going to say, let's go get the wealth of Israel, the oil, the natural resources. And they are going to you read that in context. That's what they're looking for. And they are going to go and God himself is going to make sure that they are defeated. So, so God is going to stop that conflict. So it's possible that part of this would be either the Psalm 83 war or the Ezekiel 38, 39 war. But I believe when you look at it in context, it really is civil unrest. Revelation 6, 5, he broke the third seal, and I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hands. And I heard as if it were a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. And when he broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, an ashen horse. And he who sat on it had the name Death. And Hades was following with him. And authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, to kill with famine, and with pestilence, and by the wild beast of the earth. At this point, by the breaking of this third seal, things really start to get bad because now the effects of civil unrest, 
and war and hyperinflation begin to cause famine and food shortages and death and pestilence and disease begin to really take control at this point. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 7, he said, nation is going to rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There are going to be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of the birth pains. And so Jesus called it and he said, there are going to be famines that are going to happen. Nations are going to rise up against nation. Most scholars look at this seal being open as referring to widespread famine on the earth, possibly as a result of the warfare of the civil unrest. Now you can imagine what's going to happen to the food chain and the food supply if civil unrest really begins to happen. You can imagine what will happen to the food supply if all of a sudden literally millions of Christians are removed and they're removed out of their jobs and the things that they did and, and all of those things now are unfilled. There's going to be a huge disruption to everything that happens. The scales here are symbolizing food that has to be weighed out very carefully. Food is going to be rationed at this point in the tribulation. It is in such short supply that when it talks about a denarius buying just a little bit, a denarius is a day's wage. And so I want you to get the picture, right? A day's wage for somebody working is going to be barely enough to feed that individual, let alone their family. In that day, the inflation is going to be so high that men and women are going to go to work and earn just enough food to sustain one person, the money for just enough food to sustain one person, let alone their entire family. And so you see what will happen then with with disease starting to happen and starvation starting to happen. This is really going to get bad. It's going to start to get bad at this point. You would work all day long, and at best you'd be able to work to earn enough for your own needs and nothing for anybody else that you care about. It's interesting here that he says, don't hurt the oil and the wine. And so it seems to indicate that. There's going to be some class stuff going on. And those who are in the upper class who can afford the luxuries of the oil and wine are going to be okay. But it's going to be the common people who are out in the trenches who are eating the basics and aren't going to be able to get the basics. You know, And so it's, it's really going to get interesting. The economic impact of the famine will likely prepare the people for the Antichrist to really come in and grab control at that point if he doesn't already have control. Because at that point, you have to understand that he is going to, he is going to literally be uh, endowed with Satan, right? He's literally going to be turned over to Satan as we come into the middle of the tribulation. And so he's going to have a lot of knowledge and a lot of answers that go far beyond just human wisdom. And he's going to have the answers to the world's problems. The fourth seal. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, this is Revelation 6, 7, and 8, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I looked, and before me there was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. I just read that. Hold on. I'm going back. Did I read this incorrectly? I did read this incorrectly. The third seal, I went right to the fourth seal. I'm going to get back to this one. The, the third seal is he had a pair of scales in his hands and the quart of wheat for a denarius, the quart of barley for a denarius. The fourth seal is death and Hades. And so he said, I looked and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was death. Hades followed close behind him. They were given the power to kill a fourth of the earth by sword, famine, plague, and by the wild beast of the earth. In Matthew 24, 9, Jesus said, then you'll be handed over to be persecuted, to be put to death, and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. The color of that fourth horse is translated in many ways. We understand that pale horse. We understand that it's a symbol of death. Some Bible verses translate it as pale. Some translate it as ashen or a pale green. The Greek word there is chloros, which is greenish. It is significant because it's the word that we get the word chlorophyll from. 
right? It's a tiny green chemical that converts the leaves of most plants, but chlorine gas was used in warfare in the First World War, and it may suggest that part of what is going on here during this war is actually chemical warfare, which we know as we look at that internationally, we see that that is happening and those weapons are being developed. Nuclear weapons are being developed in a pace that is unprecedented at this point. But at any rate, the intended picture here is a sickly, pale horse which symbolizes death as a result of everything else that's been going on. And so it's an accumulation of the civil unrest. It's accumulation of wars that are happening. It's accumulation of food not being there. It's an accumulation of starvation and pestilence and disease that are starting to really now take effect. You see that it just kind of has a snowball effect as these seals are being unleashed, right? At, at this point, the significant part of this is, at this point, 25%, a fourth of the earth is going to be affected by this. 25% of the population of the planet will die at this point by the fourth seal being open. I want you to know, understand how significant that is. I mean, if the Christians were still here at that point, which I don't believe we would be, right now there's just under 8 billion people on the planet. That means 2 billion people would, would die within the first four seals being open. And to put that into perspective, in World War I and World War II combined, 77 million people died in those two wars combined. And you know how horrific those two wars were. Two billion is 24 times that amount. Okay, just to put it into perspective. Why do I point that out? Because if you start reading on the internet and you start asking yourself the question, are we in the tribulation right now? That's a big question that people ask. Are the seals being opened right in front of us because we see some of these things happen, right? The answer is no. We are not in the tribulation yet. As bad as it may seem like it's getting, it is not as bad as what we just read in those first four seals being opened. First off, there's been no Antichrist who's been revealed, no one who's gone on a global conquest. We haven't seen death that happens from war and famines and, uh, and, and all of those other things that go with it, you know, disease and sickness, to the level of two billion people who are currently on this planet being affected by it. And so as bad as it is, just putting that into perspective to understand that, you know, it's, it's nothing right now compared to where it's going to go. And so the, so the question here is, you know, what do we do about that? You know, it's one of the reasons why we should be compelled to give that message out. There are going to be many people who are saved during the tribulation. Once you get into chapter 7, you're going to find that uh, with the opening of the sixth seal, that there's a picture of 144,000 Jewish believers who are converted Jewish believers who are going to be super evangelists that come out of that point in Revelation chapter 7. You, you see right around that time uh, where there's this pause between the seals being opened and you see that picture, right? So there are going to be many people who are saved during the tribulation. But the fact is, us understanding what it's going to be like should compel us to say, I don't want any of my family, any of my friends, anybody who I'm even acquainted with to have to go through that. Because if we really understood how bad that was going to be, some of you have been in, in military service. Some of you have seen the horrors of war. Some of you are in the medical field or have been in the medical field and you have seen the toll of of sickness and disease on somebody's body. Some of you have been first responders and you've seen accidents and horrific things that have happened. Multiply that to the level of two billion people being affected. It should compel us to look at those we love and to get even that more serious about telling them, hey, you need to get right with the Lord. Amen. You know, you need to really consider where your walk is with the Lord. Why don't you stand with me there is a great picture with the opening of the fifth seal. With the fifth seal, I just want to read this to you, and we're going to close with this. He said, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar 
the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer, while both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were, were completed. This is an incredible picture because, first off, it shows us that sometimes when we see people who suffer for the sake of the gospel and lose their life for the sake of the gospel, it's easy for us to say, God, where were you in the middle of that situation? God, why did you let them go through that? Why did you allow that to happen? But I wanted you to see that picture as we close out tonight because what we see is there is a special place for anyone who has lost their life for the gospel message for Jesus Christ. And it is literally right under his throne. That is where they are today, waiting for this whole thing to wrap up, right? And, and at some point, as we get into the tribulation, they're going to get impatient and they're going to say, Lord, how long? How much longer until our blood has been avenged? And God is going to look at them. And this is how, this is how incredibly merciful our God is. Even in the midst of pouring out judgment on this planet, he is going to look at them and he's going to say, take these white robes. It's going to be just a little while longer because there are still people who are going to surrender to me. There are still people who are going to go through this thing. There are still people who are going to wind up in the exact same place that you are, having turned their lives over to me and given their hearts to Jesus Christ. And that's what it is all about, right? It is about... It is about the fact that when we look at what we see in this world all around us and we get impatient and we want to see the return of Jesus today, and I say, come Lord Jesus, right? We want to see it, and if it happened tonight, we'd all be happy. But I want you to understand something. He is waiting for a reason. He is waiting for a reason. He is being patient for a reason. And in this time, He's given you and I the opportunity to, sh to share the gospel message with somebody who needs to hear it, right? Somebody who still hasn't surrendered. One day, it's going to be too late. One day, it's going to end, and he's going to say, okay, it is time. But that time hasn't happened yet, and that means that you and I have an incredible opportunity, right? Incredible opportunity to trust him for some great things. That's the exciting part about where we're at. He's going to use us in this time. There are people who are going to hear the gospel message and they are going to surrender their hearts and lives to him forever. I'm praying that we're part of that. I'm praying that he uses you and I. I'm praying that he gives us the honor of using us. What is he looking for? Us to surrender and us to be bold, us to be faithful, us to be the servant that he's called us to be. Father, I'm just coming before you tonight, Lord. I thank you for your presence in this place, Lord. And I thank you that even when we look at the things that are going to happen, Lord, and we see how severe they're going to be, Lord, and what is going to happen, Lord, that we can still look to you and we can understand your goodness in all of it. Father, that you are still waiting, Lord. You are still looking for people to surrender their lives to you. Lord, I know that it is not your desire that any should perish, Lord, but that everyone should come to a saving knowledge of who Jesus is. Lord, I'm praying that for friends, Lord. I'm praying that for family members, Lord. I'm praying that for children, Lord, who are on our heart, Lord. Aunts and uncles, Lord. Extended family members, Lord. People that we know at work, Lord. I'm praying that for Lacombe, Louisiana. And Lord, I'm asking that in this day, Lord, in this hour, that you would use us, Lord, as your mouthpiece. Father, that people who might otherwise be on their way to an eternity in hell would be apprehended. Lord, that they would be grabbed before that point, Lord, and that they would be ushered into the kingdom of God because of the faithfulness, Lord, of your people, Lord, and who you are. Lord, I'm asking simply you would use us in this hour by your spirit any way that you want to use us, Lord. Give us the boldness, Lord, to be able to step through and do exactly what you've called us to do. Lord, give us the words to speak, Lord, the courage, Lord, to stand where you have placed us, Lord. And I'm asking that you would open doors in this hour that we never thought were possible. Lord, I'm asking, Father, that your anointing and your power would go with us. Lord, that when we step out, Lord, that it would be from you and not from us, Lord, and that there would be a demonstration of your spirit in what we say and what we do 
and that this world would be changed because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. If you're online, we're so glad that you guys joined us tonight. God bless you.